Hey Fit Pros, it's your host Tyler Valencia here. I quickly want to share a free resource we have on the KIPS website and YouTube channel. If you're struggling with your online workouts or just want to see the items that we recommend, check out our virtual training resources page. You'll find breakdowns on streaming setups, reviews on microphones, and other free videos that can help you build your fitness business today. Did I mention they're free? Go check them out at the link in the description or head over to our website to find them under the blog tab. Welcome to the KIPPS Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of KIPPS and Time to Train Fitness. We're going to be talking about an area of the fitness industry that it's a new one for me, but one that I enjoy discussing. Our guest, Krista Fairbrother. Thank you for being my guest on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. So Krista, let's kick things off for the listeners. Give yourself uh, and our listeners a little breakdown about you, how you got started in the industry and your background. Thank you. That's that's a really long story <laughs> that I always do my best to condense. Mm -hmm. So uh, I live currently in Gulfport, Florida now, and I'm an aqua yoga coach and trainer. And how I came to that is actually 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was a farrier. So for those who don't mm. know what that is, it's somebody who puts horseshoes on horses. Somebody still has to do that by hand. And you're bent over a lot. You're lifting a lot of weight. It is not good for your back. So I'd heard from somebody, oh, well, you should do yoga because, you know, that'll help your back. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. I'll try yoga. I really was not sold on it. Mm -hmm. So I went to a yoga class and I actually really kind of liked it. I left and it was like, wow, that, that did kind of make my back feel good. So I kept going. And then finally, it was not only did I continue to go to classes, I had started a personal practice that I would do in the mornings before I left for work. And so fast forward now, years and years, you know, I've decided to stop being a farrier. I went back to school, got a master's degree, had a couple kids, moved across the country. And my kids now finally are both in elementary school. And it was like, OK, it's I've been doing yoga for 20 years. This is clearly something I really like. Maybe it's time to go to yoga teacher training. And like many people who sign up for yoga teacher training, I was not really thinking, oh, I am going to teach yoga. It was really about really trying to deepen my own practice and connect more with yoga. And when I went into that teacher training, I had a diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus. It's mm. an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And I was a little worried about it flaring up doing so much yoga, but I thought, okay, you know, I, I can handle this. This will be okay. In the middle of that teacher training, I got some new diagnoses and it turns out I had many more kinds of arthritis and I had a lot of cognitive dissonance with trying to explain, okay, well, how had I shod horses and been an athlete and ridden so many years and done all these things with all these kinds of arthritis that I had clearly had since I was a kid, because that's how long the symptoms have been going on. Mm -hmm. And basically I thought, you know, it was the yoga is I really stumbled into the best self-management techniques and tools that I really could have. And that's, what's been keeping me going. So it became immediately like, oh my gosh, this is my calling. So I went immediately on to yoga for arthritis teacher training, which is a specialty certificate for yoga. And it was actually there that I met another yoga for arthritis teacher who casually mentioned, oh, I have this yoga and wine night at the pool once a week. I was like, oh my God, why has no one ever told me about this? And I had no internet access there, but I instantly went home and Googled how to do aqua yoga teacher training and left for that. And the, the rest was history, as they say, that has become my yoga passion. And that's really now what I specialize in. I love it. I love the, the background on it. And what I've really seen with this podcast and the guests that come on is they have that moment that really pushes them further into their passion. We hear instructors, individuals talk about it a lot, their passion and what pushes them further into it. And I think that that is an area that you hear a lot about and finding that passion it just opens up this world of, oh, I want to get creative in this way. I want to take this extra step. I want to take this risk because you you want to share it. You want to build in that area and you want to learn more about it. If you are in a position within your industry where you're not happy about it, you're doing something you don't like, it's it's hard to look around and think, I don't really want to do this. I don't really want to learn more about it. But once you find that thing, you're like, yeah, 
Let's let's get more. Let's find out more. I want to take all of this on. And yes. so I love those stories and when guests share those in the podcast. And something I kind of want to shift to with talking about Aqua is something that you and I were actually talking about before hitting the record button, and it's with barriers to Aqua. I think that hearing from Aqua individuals is always a great thing because sharing more about it is how I think other instructors can see, wow, this is something I'm not even tapping into, and there's so much potential with it. What do you believe for, we'll say, the majority of fitness professionals are some barriers for them to teach Aqua exercise? Why? So why do you think that a lot of fit pros don't want to teach aqua? That is a great question. I, one of the most common pieces of feedback that I get from my fellow professionals is some have concerns for the pay scales because in aquatics, it's, it's kind of like if you're a personal trainer and you're getting your rate and then you're going to move into aquatic fitness, you know, you kind of have potentially come down into that group fitness pay scale, mm. which is, you know, pros know it's like, oh yeah, ow. Mm -hmm. So there's that barrier because it would take you some time, obviously, to be able to get to the point of within aquatics to get back to being able to offer private sessions and have that demand for your services. So I hear that from fellow pros is it's like, oh, it's just taken on this, this pay scale I'm not ready for. Mm -hmm. I hear I, a big one is I think it's literally just a lack of awareness because if you're a fitness pro who's used to working on land and you're not somebody who goes in the pool yourself, why mm -hmm. would you ever consider it? You know, that's, that's like common sense. It's like being a dog trainer when you're a cat person, you know, you just don't do it. And so I think there's the onus is almost on us as aquatics people that we don't get the word out in general enough. You know, yeah. if I can't convince a colleague that this is amazing, how can I convince a client? Yeah. And so I think we need, we just need to do a lot more to speak to what the general benefits are uh, for everybody, not just that traditional aquatics um, audience that you often hear spoken to, which is that active over older adult. We talked about that a little bit, mm -hmm. but just that who aquatics can be for, what it can do, and, and while the pay scales, you know, might seem a little problematic from the exterior that there are some opportunities, the same in every aspect of fitness to, to earn what you want to in, for your business goals. Yeah, I like that. I like both of those. Uh, the piece that I want to ask you now has to do with the evolution of Aqua. I think that that was something interesting that you and I were talking about. Another topic prior to hitting record was kind of the evolution of aqua and if anybody that's listening follows me on instagram they know that i do sports that are uh different i think that's the best way to explain it they're different they require lifting heavy things and it's something that someone would probably look at and be like he doesn't like aqua he's not about it but i love yeah jumping in the pool. And there has been times where I buy a lot of aqua stuff because it's so beneficial. What have you seen with the evolution of aqua training in let's say the last three to five years? That's a good question. I think there, the initial impact of aqua is in terms of, okay, well, everybody thinks of it as a swimming modality, right? Mm -hmm. So the evolution, this happened before I entered the industry, where it was this idea of, well, we could do head out water exercise and it's not just the hydrotherapy. I'm going to hang out in the water, right? Mm -hmm. So there was that evolution of, well, we can exercise in the water with our head out, and not also, I should, I mentioned the hydrotherapy, excuse me, I should also say, you know, there was the European tradition of things like Watsu and the massage and the water. So, mm. so that aspect of what was there as well. Mm -hmm. But this idea of, like you say, you can cross train in the water. So we've yeah. had some Europeans who are very engaged in those hydrotherapy components come over and say, well, you know, the water's great. Why aren't you getting your athletes in the water? Yeah. And then we've had people working in, um, helping women through the birthing process who have been able to say, okay, well, it's not just about water birth. You can prepare for birth by working and working out in the water. And then you can get yourself back to your pre baby fitness levels. If that is your goal mm -hmm. by working in the water. Right. So we've had a lot more awareness of that. Um, speaking to aqua yoga, 
<laughs> obviously that's why I'm on your podcast is I'm always mm-hmm. like, I, I feel a little bit like we're the rainbow unicorns of the yoga world. <laughs> we just were really hard to find and uh-huh. that shouldn't be right. We, you should be able to think about yoga. Think how many people do yoga and what a big industry yoga is. Of course you yeah. can do yoga in the pool. So, yeah. so that I would, of course, is my, you know, my thing, I would say that um, as well as there's people out there working to, to broaden who aqua fitness is for in terms of, I've already mentioned a lot about ability, but about age so that it can be for your younger athlete. And there's a lot of, you know, reasons to do that. A lot of professional sports teams, excuse me, are now uh, training in the water because it's so great for both recovery and injury prevention. So we're seeing more and more of that. And that's not, you know, my area of expertise, but I hear about it and think it's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I will say for anybody that, is listening and they have access to a pool and they're maybe on the fence about it, go in there, do some sets, do some activities that you might do on land, in the grass, and try to do them. See what you think. I I think it'll change your mind immediately. And then all of a sudden you start adding in the equipment and you're like, oh, wow, I love doing this. It's it's a game changer for for myself and for individuals that want to learn more. Uh, It's so wide open for what you can do. So let's now switch back to your area. I think you, you just hit on it just a bit, but I think that now diving into it would be great. What are the differences with aqua yoga versus modern yoga? So I'm going to clarify and say modern yoga, you mean like land yoga, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. I would say aqua yoga is very modern yoga, right? Um, that is a great question. I'm teasing a little bit, but that, that does speak it. to our perceptions, right? Of, well, mm-hmm. aqua yoga, well, what is it? So, so making that transfer, you were just speaking to, hey, if you, if you normally do these sports and you can get in the water and try them out, for example, what is that? Is you're thinking about the water's viscosity. So this is a great transition point. Um, thinking about if you played golf, if you played tennis, you don't have to buy fancy aquatic gear. Take your golf club and your or your tennis racket into the water and pretend you're playing, but do it underwater. And you're going to notice there is a lot of viscosity to mm-hmm. that water. You're not moving through the air anymore. Obviously, it's not honey or maple syrup, but you've <laughs> got a lot of resistance from the water. And mm-hmm. that is one of the benefits you are going to get for your, your modality, whatever sport you're normally playing, right? By now suddenly upping the ante on the viscosity. So when we think about moving yoga into the pool, well, that is one huge difference is you're now in this really thick environment. So how you would build strength in aqua yoga is actually potentially, for example, like doing some movements with your arms, which we don't think about in mat yoga. We tend to take a pose and then we hold it and Mm -hmm. the teacher might give you some nice instruction on yoga philosophy. Meanwhile, you're starting to quiver from that isometric hold, right? (laughs) You get in the pool because of the buoyancy, which we'll get to in a second, you are not working as hard to hold yourself up. But when you start moving your arms around, you are going to have to work extremely hard to stabilize your torso in the water because our water or excuse me, our torso wants to roll and turn when we're in the water. Mm -hmm. And the act of stabilizing and keeping ourselves where we intend to be builds a lot of strength. Yeah. So there's that viscosity. That's a big one. I mentioned the buoyancy. So the buoyancy, everybody knows you get in the water and you're getting a little floaty, right? In aqua yoga, we do, ideally, we work at about mid-chest height. So you've offloaded about 70% of your weight. And that can be really huge for certain populations. So obviously, the active older adult is more likely to live with osteoarthritis. But you've heard me talk about my story. I have a bunch of kinds of inflammatory arthritis, which affect anybody at any age, And so if you live with any kind of chronic pain condition, arthritis is a very common one, but there's lots of others out there that to be able to get into the water and get that relief from the water's buoyancy, which literally takes some load off is huge. And then when you think about the hydrostatic pressure, so the hydrostatic pressure, when you get in the water and there's that feeling of the water's pushing in on you everywhere, kind of like you climbed into a little body sock, that's the hydrostatic pressure because we were talking about the water's more viscous. The, the molecules are packed more densely. Mm-hmm. That's going to give you some physiological changes that you're going to encounter that you wouldn't have in land yoga. So your blood's not going to pull in your feet. 
your heart's going to be more efficient. Your kidneys are going to turn over faster. So all those benefits that you would get from being in the water, whether it's swimming, head out of water exercise, hydrotherapy, just literally that being in the water. When you put yoga in the water, you get those that you would not get out of land yoga. Okay. Okay. So I'm building a picture in my head and some of it's from... Um, just going through your Instagram and getting a better idea of aqua yoga. Can you paint a picture with an exercise, just a go-to exercise of how you would set someone up? And because I think that that is something that individuals might have trouble that are listening. Sure. Because exactly what you mentioned with uh, with modern or traditional yoga on land, I, I want to make sure I get the term there, <laughs> is that <laughs> you, they're, they're bent over, they're holding a position, and they might be thinking, how can you bend over in a pool or how can you hold a position? So paint a picture for someone with an, uh, an exercise that you will typically go through in a class. Okay, perfect. So if you think about a lunge, so it – most people listening, you know, they're fitness pros. You've taught a gazillion lunges, right? So one foot steps forward, you bend the knee. It's in line with its toes, back heels up. So that normal lunge base in yoga, so modern, bland, whatever, whatever we want to term it, <laughs> your arms would often go up overhead and we would call that warrior one, right? But when we get in the pool, putting my arms overhead, yes, they're out of the water. I'm not really explaining the benefits of all these things I just talked about with the water. So what could we do instead of that moving in the sagittal plane, which is moving my arms parallel to the long edge of the mat, which we do so much of in land yoga. Instead, if I put them down alongside my body and say, I stepped forward with that right foot. So I'm doing a lunge with the right foot leading. If I then take one hand at a time and perturb the water with it, I am going to get dramatic twisting forces that I'm going to have to work to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And people get a lot of benefits to their low back, their thigh muscles. We haven't talked to, you know, like knee arthritis. One of the best things you could do is build up the thigh muscles to resist that. So they're going to really have to work their leg muscles they're going to have to work their upper body because again, you ask somebody to move their arms and they're getting a little unstable. Their shoulders tend to hike up, right? So they have to learn to depress those and engage those muscles in the top of their back. And you would ideally offer these kinds of things within the yoga tradition of kind of some in investigative questioning. So, Hey, if I'm doing that lunge leading on the right leg and you perturb the water with just the right hand, what's happening? Okay, what, you know, what is that doing to your body? Okay, now you're going to do it with just the left hand. What's that doing? Mm -hmm. So the idea of people are getting these benefits physically, which we've spent a lot of time talking about, but then you add in the yoga philosophy, which is the same in the pool as on land, and really get them to learn more about themselves, their bodies, and make whatever fitness modality they choose to do more effective for them. Because to me, the overall benefit of aqua yoga isn't really just these physical things, mm -hmm. but that the, the what people get out of it, the full package is going to make them more effective in their daily life because that's yeah. really where the rubber hits the road, right? Yeah. So by giving them these kind of informative leading questions, it's like, okay, well, how is this you know working for you and helps them build the, the matching service, so to speak, of, okay, I'm doing this in the pool. Well, when I get out of the pool, how's this going to help me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the pieces that you hit on that I think is across the board with Aqua working in the pool is with core training. I mean, the modalities that I use, they simulate movements that I do on land and in the sport that I compete in and just the slightest movements at, in the pool. Yes. You, you start to feel things and all of a sudden you're having to squeeze or apply yeah. pressure and all these different areas that you never thought that when you're on land, you're like, oh, no, I can just put my two feet down and I can just oh, accomplish yeah, this yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not working at all to stay attached to the pool floor. Yeah. Um, when, when the pool floor isn't there, you know, when the water isn't there and a great one is plank, you know, a lot yeah. of fitness pros, they're like, oh, I could hold a plank all day long. Hmm. So when I put you in the water now, well, you can't put your hands down on the pool floor. So what are you going to do? Well, I put your hands on a pool noodle. So now you're doing kind of a half floating plank mm -hmm. <laughs> and it really changes your perceptions of plank and, and what it does for you. So, yeah. Yeah. But Absolutely. I mean, that type of work. In my mind and my opinion too, with uh, I teach 
core lectures whenever I go to conferences and being more efficient. And I think over the last few years, it's finally coming out more how, okay, just doing super long planks is it's not the best way to train the core. And so exactly what you mentioned there, if you're now doing a plank on a noodle, now you're having to squeeze and pull in muscles that you typically don't. You're learning more about your body. Your client is learning right. more about their body that they didn't think, oh, I, I have to squeeze this. I have to do this to get my core going, to strengthen it. Yeah. You're not just holding this long plank, a five minute plank on the ground and you think, okay, yeah, I have a strong core. No, there's so right. much more part of it that uh, not just for the clients, but being able to teach it and the efficiency of it. I think that that goes so much further than um, I'm going to teach aqua. I think it's a, it's a great reason to look into it as a fit pro. Um, let's shift a little bit now towards your practice. I think that that's always an interesting topic to hear from guests and especially with something like aqua yoga. Um, how has the last two years, what has that done and where have you kind of shifted your practice to? Yes, we've all really struggled with COVID and lockdowns and and in the pools, it's been highly impactful. Yeah. So every state and country is different. I actually help people all over the world. So I've heard a lot of different stories about what lockdowns are doing around the world. So being in Florida, we, you know, setting politics aside, we were open very quickly. <laughs> and so we actually only were subject to about six weeks of lockdowns in outdoor pools. Mm hmm. And, and then we were subject to social distancing for a while. As of now, everything's, you know, open. We can, we can do whatever. Mm -hmm. I personally, because you heard me speak to my health story, being medically vulnerable is I gave up all my teaching indoors. So mm -hmm. I no longer teach at my local Y in the indoor pool. And I did teach some land yoga previous to the pandemic. And I've totally given that up. I only teach aqua outside now. Mm -hmm. So those have been... Um, big shifts there. My online activities, which I had started working towards before COVID actually have continued. And what I have found is while I've had more time to put into those, it's been actually very hard for my clients because if you want to start teaching aqua, but you're locked out of the pool, where do you have to go to practice? You know, most mm -hmm. of the country isn't Florida with all these outdoor pools. You know, you have to go to the indoor pool. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a state or province that has been shut down for six months, you, you just have nowhere to practice. Yeah. So it has been very impactful for the industry because the, the biggest barrier almost is the fact you have to have the pool. Yep. You know, it's beautiful in mat yoga. All you need is a mat and you can take it to the park and you can put it on your bike and all this freedom. And it's lovely and that's great. And we are kind of tied to the pools uh, for the most part. I do, I have worked with a couple people on the, uh, in the Indian Ocean in the country of Mauritius. I trained a couple wow. of gals and they work out in the ocean, which is <laughs> awesome because that doesn't close. And it's the equator, so it's good all year long. Yeah. So that's amazing. But most of us, only a small slice of the world is going to get to do that. So um, <laughs> as well as I, I my, you know, my language skills, I don't speak any foreign languages well enough to help anybody in another language. Mm -hmm. So I am dealing mostly with the English speaking world as well. Yeah, yeah. With talking about your aqua yoga instructor training, before we talk more about that course, what are some of the skills that you feel like you've picked up that you're like, oh, wow, I, prior to these last couple of years uh, or even going into making your own instructor training, I would have never gone in that area. But what are some of those skills that you've picked up? Oh, that's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Yeah. For me, it's been a lot of the tech stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be the obviously the, the easy one to go to to say the tech but then there's also i would say some different social dynamics to leading groups like over zoom or any yeah. kind of online format than there are in person and and so that's been a, a sort of learning curve so for example i said i gave up my on my land teaching one of the venues i used to teach a lot at libraries mm -hmm. and i did actually some kids yoga classes 
And so I'm in my living room streaming yoga for the library. And I'm used to, you know, the energy of the kids and the screaming and the, <laughs> it's all fine. I'm obviously I teach in polls. I'm used to craziness and it's just <laughs> silence. I, yeah. There's no kids videos on. There's nothing. It's like, I'm being like super excited and crazy because yeah. it's kids and it's just crickets. And it was yeah. very odd, <laughs> very, very <laughs> odd. So there's, you know, that dynamic of how do you learn to keep your energy up for the people receiving it without mm -hmm. that feedback? Because normally you would, you know, there's that energy exchange. So, so the energy exchange and then facilitating groups online has been educational. I, I said that I, you know, made that career switch when I stopped being a farrier. I have a master's in museum education. So I used to do a lot of education content in museums and that's a lot of group work again. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very different dynamic to give a lecture to 200 people compared to talking to even four people online. <laughs> um, so I definitely had to improve those skills in terms of those tech and those kind of computer things. I have to admit, I haven't found a way to transfer them to be better in person. <laughs> I don't I don't think we all get better to be better human beings by talking to screens. So I'm, I'm sorry for that one. I have no wisdom there. Mm -hmm. That's a uh... <laughs> it's uh, it's such a different world. I think that's yeah. the best way to explain it. I've definitely shifted even my uh, way of explaining it to instructors with the other company that I own, Time to Train Fitness, where we do online workouts. I've now had to be more honest with individuals and just being, I, I don't know if not honest is the best way to say it, but the, um, I just had to be more forward. I think that's the word that I'm looking for in telling them that online workouts is different than in person just how yeah. you mentioned with the dynamics of it you get that energy when you're in a class and i remember when i used to teach group fitness classes sometimes i'd be in a, a basketball um gym and all of a sudden you, you got all these people standing in front and then you blast the music you feel the energy you're just yeah. you feel you're there. You're running around yeah you're just there you're present and with those classes too with in terms of making I don't know, mistakes you if you make a mistake you just Okay, yeah, sorry, I meant this instead. And people are still gonna show up. People are still gonna enjoy it. You still have a good time. With online workouts, sometimes you only have one shot. You got one shot, you gotta be on and you gotta have that energy. And just how you mentioned, no, it might feel that nobody's there. And so you're <laughs> generating this energy out of nothing. So it's a very different experience for instructors. And it's it's kind of, it, it's like a presentation. It's like a showcase. It's like you're acting, but that's one different area of it. So, um, I always like hearing those stories from fit pros and, um, what they've gone through and especially with their different areas within the fitness industry. So, um, let's talk about your course that you made your aqua yoga instructor training yeah. with it. What was kind of the guiding uh, process behind it? What was your thought process? And okay, I want to get this out more. I want to share it more. What was going through your head? It was literally just, yeah, trying to work with these people who were coming to me and saying, hey, I, I really want to learn aqua yoga. I want aqua yoga in my community. How mm -hmm. can I learn? And when I say that these people who are coming to me, it is like these people in Africa, in Asia, yeah. in Australia. And, and there's no way I can get on a plane and make this happen. And this was all pre COVID. So wow. this wasn't, you know, the, the barriers to travel that we're facing now, this was literally like it just the, the finances and the, and the logistics of how do you make all this happen? Mm -hmm. And in-person trainings are lovely. We all, you know, again, we're speaking to that energy and we, especially right now, we all really miss them. <laughs> So I don't have to go into that, but it, there are just some real logistic challenges to those in-person connections. And so really what was driving it was that feedback I'm getting from my audience is, you know, would you please create this because we, we really want to have this. And so I actually started all the work in 2019. I rolled out the training and literally the week we started the training was the week we all shut down here in Florida. <laughs> so it was literally like, okay, all, I know some of you are still in the pools. We're locked down here. We're just going to roll with it. And so I, that very first training, I had obviously set out a timeline and a curriculum and we just kind of crumpled that up and made some changes. <laughs> and uh -huh. I, I actually had my highest graduation rate out of that very first training. I think literally because 
everybody got 18 weeks of support when they had thought they were going to get six. Mm. So they got a lot of attention and we worked really hard. And those people who signed up the first time were also, you know, those kind of those people who had been knocking down my door to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So they were really gung ho. But so that was like, wow. Okay. Um, So now I've been offering it since COVID. It continues to be a challenge as, you know, pull lockouts and these kinds of things. I am fortunate. I have a very modest backyard pool, but it is there. And I've got high speed internet access right there mm-hmm. in my pool. So <laughs> whenever anybody has, we, you know, we do our live sessions with the course, but I'm just meaning in addition to that, if anybody has a question, you know, I can just hop in the pool and do a little video for them and send it out to everybody. It's, it's super easy in that way. Um, as you would do in a land class. Right. So mm-hmm. that's, that's really a, a perk for me to have that there. Um, and then as well, is I really try on draw on my background in education to really provide a positive learning environment. People mm-hmm. learn in different ways. They're looking to engage with different people on their end as clients and, and make it not just about the aqua yoga. Yes. I mean, obviously that's the topic, but I need to deliver the curriculum the same as you would deliver a cooking class or a craft class or any, you know, anything else that you might take, you need that quality level of instruction and mm-hmm. having that background. I feel pretty strongly about that. So, so that was obviously went into a lot of, of what I was doing when I was designing the course. So thinking about, well, it's not just all audio. It's not just all video. Um, I don't want people to be cooking their dinner while they're listening to me talk. <laughs> That's, I know we all do it and it happens, mm-hmm. but ideally they're, you know, they're practicing, they're, they're really applying it. And, and I think that is a great goal for us to have if we're fitness professionals and we're designing fitness courses for other fitness pros, this should really all be actionable stuff. I, yeah. There's no reason I should bore you that I should make this irrelevant. You should be able to take everything I give you and be like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know that I'm going to apply it now. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's really the, has been my impetus and my goal in doing it. Yeah. I got a question. It's probably just more for me than for the listeners. Yeah. (laughs) And so what do you feel like in terms of concessions that you've made that was making online education that you've had to change from when you first started? I think that for me, it's really been the mindset of uh, I've been, working for companies. And when I started KIPS, uh, of course, I had the best intentions of all of making education and showcasing all my skills. And I think early on, though, I learned that there's always going to be instructors that they just want the the CEUs. They, that's all they want. And it, it yeah. hurts. It really does hurt as an educator, as someone that develops content. Yeah. And so I've had to make that change in mindset for yourself. Have you had any of those things when you first started making instructor training courses that uh, I just have to switch off of this? Yeah, that's an interesting observation. And I hear what you're saying. I think it it speaks to being the heart of an educator Mm -hmm. is is you really you want to get that information and have people love it. And it's just the same to kind of compare it to the fitness pros who are listening, it's the same as when you're working with your clients, when you have that client who is just like, I am here and they are giving 110% for them, you know, whatever their 110% is, they are always fully showing up and they're always fully engaged compared to that person who got the gift certificate and is showing up because their spouse <laughs> and they're just kind of rolling with the motions. And you know, when their six weeks is up, they're done. Mm-hmm. You never, they're going to ghost on you. You're never going to see them again. Mm-hmm. So, so I hear, you know, exactly what you're saying there. And um, for me, I think the biggest one has been trying to educate people about why I have an evaluation component. Mm -hmm. A lot of online education these days is you just watch the stuff. And when you get to a hundred percent on the bar, (laughs) you click, click, and it gives you, spits you out your certificate (laughs) and you earned your CEUs and you're done. Mm -hmm. And I strongly feel like if you've worked with me and you're getting the certification from me and my name is going somewhere associated with you, that we should have a little talk about how that went. And so I actually require people to submit a video sample, which has been, you know, hard. A lot of people don't have those tech skills. That's not why they're taking an aqua yoga Mm -hmm. training is because they're good at recording videos. I totally understand that. So I very much try to make it as 
um, pain free in terms of the tech that they need to make this happen. But then, yeah, we meet one on one and go over it. And I've I've gotten some pushback on that and I continue to defend the point of why that is so important. And I think Mm -hmm. it speaks to, you know, how I started, you know, mirroring what you're saying in terms of, yeah, we're educators. We, we want people to engage with our stuff. We want the quality of the, the discipline to show. And I don't feel that that's like about me. It's like, I want you to go out and be an amazing aqua yoga teacher because you love aqua yoga, mm-hmm. not because it was, you know, about me really. And the bottom, the bottom line is I want you to have a great impact on your community. And so I have to show up and I'm being hard on you in, from a tech perspective of making you get me that video because I want you to really be able to feel confident and, and have that quality experience. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Another question for me before we get to some of our last questions here, but uh, what kind of sparked something interesting in my mind was when you were talking about how that you do have access to a pool and when you have a question and you want to demonstrate, be able to put some thought into a response to an individual, you'll go, you'll go out there with myself and learning more about Aqua and filming more Aqua stuff in the last few years. It's been a task and a half. It's, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you're filming indoors, you are now dealing with one of the biggest echoes you'll ever hear. Yeah. Um, if you are filming someone on a deck, okay, you have a little more control. You're still worrying about those echo echoes, but now if you have someone in the pool, you're not. You can't take a microphone, a lavalier microphone in the pool. No. So you're dealing with so many different elements. Now add on to that being outside, cars driving by, planes birds, whatever that is. There's so many elements. And as someone like myself that makes content, you create controlled environments so that you don't have to deal with those. So exactly. it's, uh, it's like a, a stressful situation when I think about uh, having to film at a pool. For you, uh, what are some of your tools that you use? I think that's a great question. I love to hear that. Uh, do you have a microphone that you bring out or a camera that you specifically like to use? Yeah. So tech, tech at the pool is, is always a, a journey. I mean, I'm yeah. definitely here and I am by no means a techie, right? I have, I show up and do the best I can with the tech because this, I want to talk about aqua yoga, which these days requires tech as we've been speaking to. So please take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, because I'm sure there are tech people who can speak to this better, but I do have a camcorder with a, external mic that I can use for recording videos. Mm -hmm. I also, depending on the video, I don't necessarily record it live sound. There are times when I know I'm going to be doing a voiceover. So if Mm -hmm. anybody is hearing this and they want to, you know, look me up on Instagram or Facebook, you're going to see a lot of my voiceover videos. A lot of the short social media ones, I record the movements in the pool and then put the voiceover on top of that. Very smart. When, when you're thinking about, oh, my trainings is I actually want those people to see how hard it is at the pool. I want them to see that the mushroom is going and the kids have swim lessons and people are screaming in the background and the dump truck comes every single time I teach, (laughs) right? I want them to see that because Mm -hmm. they need to understand the challenge of what it is to teach at the pool. And so those, when I record those, I don't edit that stuff out because I want them to see it. So there's Um, there's, yeah, both those things going on. Sometimes there's, you do a shoot and you literally like you have two more sentences and some horrible noise happens and you just have (laughs) to reshoot it. And it's just very Zen. It's part of the experience. Mm -hmm. I do have underwater cameras that I use as well. Um, and those, yes, I put them on a tripod. I use those. I have a very good relationship with the pools I teach at. And so I'm also can film there. So when I actually do all my underwater filming, I do it at the pools I teach at rather than my own. I find that a lot of backyard pools, um, the depth is too shallow. And when I say the depth, I mean the, the distance between you and the wall, so mm-hmm. you just don't get nice quality of underwater shots in a small pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I like to, you know, do those in the commercial pool. Um, what other tech things can I, can I speak to? It's, I will say with experience, you get better. Yeah. So I've now been doing this, you know, I've been teaching aqua yoga seven years. I've been, I've been filming it about six. I, I can, 
I really shorten the amount of time it takes because I know there's some, you know, some things that really help. And I should give a huge shout out. I say this, like I do this all myself. My husband is my chief photographer and he's mm-hmm. become really amazing at it. So he mm-hmm. is not a photographer for a living, but he, he plays one for me. Um, another thing that really helps, I should just like a little t- tip that isn't a tech thing is calm water really helps. So when yes. I say that I go to my public pools and I, I'm allowed to film there. I'm always trying to squeeze in like the shift changes in the end of the day when there's not a lot of other people at the pool, not because I care about other people in the pool, but having the surface of the water chalked up will really change the quality of your pictures. If you're doing still pictures and even your video, if you're wanting to see what's going on below the water from above. Yeah. Um, so those are just some tiny, Oh, and wind, anybody who does filming <laughs> outside. Yes. You have to deal with wind. So be careful, do whatever, wind research you need to do for your microphone to get the wind off your microphone because that will help as well yeah yeah the uh for talking about calm water one of the tools that i've been surprised with is i will use a it's called a shotgun microphone and it's worked relatively well i'm usually not a big fan of these types of microphones um i typically use lavalier microphones when i'm filming workouts or when i'm recording content for youtube whatever it might be and shotguns just typically you're not, not my jam, I'll say, but for aqua and calm water, it's been pretty, uh, pretty good. And so that might be something for somebody to look into. Um, just one joke before we move on here, I will say that I've never been, uh, more terrified with, uh, filming aqua stuff when I have my thousand dollar camera reaching over a body of water trying to get a shot and just yeah. worried that my hands are just going to give out right there and then all of a sudden it's all gone but <laughs> yeah that's you keep going and uh, yeah. it's definitely something to to learn if that's your your area and uh, it's everything you mentioned and more with filming at a pool it's uh, it's an interesting area but it's fun and i like how you mentioned with the underwater stuff because that's a great tip right there for for people because those are cool shots they're very cool shots yeah, and the, the, what i do is so photogenic i mean people love especially in the winter this time of year people listening you know it's january it's snowing and here's this woman in florida who's got these turquoise pictures of the pool mm-hmm. and you can just like daydream a little moment it's very vicarious <laughs> pleasures yeah. So it, they're beautiful pictures when we can get them right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we're getting now to our podcast takeaways for the episode. And I love this part because of not just where I found it. And if you're a listener to the podcast, you've heard me talk about it many times. And uh, with it, though, it's a great opportunity to hear from our guests on the topic of myths within the fitness industry and uh, their experiences. Every guest that comes on has a different experience based off where they've worked, what they do now, and where they wanna go. And so sharing that and their insight is really what this question's about. So Krista, what are three myths about the fitness industry? So mine obviously come from that aqua yoga lens, as you spoke to with different Mm -hmm. guests have different perspectives. So one thing I see a lot of is that people come to fitness and or yoga because they have a body image thing. And I think it's too easy for us as fitness professionals to say, oh, well, people came to my class because they want to lose weight or they want those six pack abs or something like that. Especially people who come to yoga, they come for a pretty diverse number of reasons. It might be stress relief. It might be, you know, I work with a lot of people who deal with pain. They want to get out of pain. Um, It might be the social component, right? So, so don't always leap to, this is about somebody's body. I I think that's a pretty big one. Mm -hmm. I do within the aquatics community work with that active older adult. That is my audience. And I love working with active older adults. I think there's a perception in the fitness industry that again, fitness is just for really young, capable people. And remember if you kind of dial it back, well, why do you like fitness? Yes, you like moving, but it's also a people oriented business, right? We're in a service industry. This is about the people and seniors are just as much fun as everyone else, right? We're all just people. And so that age doesn't, shouldn't be a barrier. And in, in yoga, I think it can just as much be a barrier when you think about if you have somebody who lives in a wheelchair and they're going to do a yoga pose is their yoga pose, which is of a different shape, not 
the yoga pose that somebody that still has all their limbs doing, right? Do you have to call them separate names? Are they, is their yoga somehow less valid, right? And I think that idea of age and ability, um, I'm conflating them here as I answer, but I think that they, they go very much together in the fitness mm-hmm. world. And then the, I would say the last one is what a lot of the larger fitness world thinks about yoga, us as yogis, is that we have all these shapes we put our bodies into and we give them funky names and that's all yoga is. And yoga really hasn't lasted for thousands of years because we have some great hamstring stretch, right? Everybody's got a great hamstring stretch. My, my hamstring stretch is not better than your hamstring stretch. So it's not what yoga is about. It's really that yoga philosophy and the structure that yoga has that keeps people coming back to it and, and the full reason. So again, that idea of, you know, somebody in a wheelchair, their yoga practice is going to be just as amazing and perfect for them and for yoga as somebody who is fully able-bodied. And I think that's an important thing for fitness people to hear when they're thinking about moving into a yoga certification is kind of check your reason for doing it and what you're looking to get out of it. Because if you're just looking for those, those shapes and the names, you already have those. You don't need another cert that has a yoga title in it because you're already teaching that. And so either make some different choices about what you think yoga is, or maybe just don't do it at this time. And you know, it's there for you down the road. Yeah. Yeah. The la- the last one is the one I'm going to just briefly comment on because it sparked something in my mind with past guests that have been, that are yogis that are in the yoga education realm. And they've said almost word for word, the same thing with finding yeah. something that speaks to you more than just the initials after your name or the poses you're going to do what speaks to you. And I think that that's such a great tip beyond yoga with looking at education. How does this speak to you? Finding something that is going to make you want to learn with it. I think that that speaks to this whole episode with expanding more into the areas that you want to go to as a fitness pro. And so I like that. I like that a lot with so much more than um, anything that we talk about with education, with growing your career, all that kind of stuff. So great stuff right there. Krista, before we sign off here, can you give listeners information on how to find you, social media, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So my website is my name, Krista, C-H-R-A-S-T-A and Fair Brother, just like it sounds, F-A-I-R, brother.com. And I have a lot of free videos people can check out if they're interested in trying yoga out in their pool or if they're a fitness pro and they're like, okay, I'm ready to drink the Kool-Aid. I might be thinking (laughs) about this. Um, I will also give a shout out. I have a book that's coming out in July. It's being published by Singing Dragon Press in the UK, and it's a teaching book. It's called Water Yoga, A Teacher's Guide. So if you're thinking, oh, you know, I might I might really be interested in this before you invest in a training, that'll be a really great resource for you. So you can find more information out about that on my website, or I'm also, of course, on social media, Facebook. It's just Krista Fairbrother yoga and on instagram it's aqua content yogi with an i love it and we'll have those links in the description for this episode uh, depending upon where you find it whether it's on spotify apple Podcasts, or the landing page we'll have the direct link for that krista thank you for coming on the kips podcast this episode flew by great information in it and just a pleasure to speak with you Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I hope everybody's key takeaway is yoga is better when wet. Love it.